Hello and welcome to another episode of Feeding Under Fire. My name is Simon Walker. I'm a PhD candidate from the University of Strathclyde and today I'm going to be talking to you about medicinal food. But before I get started, I want to say a massive thank you to The Recipe Project because this video is going to be part of their issue this month. Also, there is an article to go with it which focuses on the recipes, so I hope you enjoy that very much as well. Secondly, I probably should warn you, I'm a little bit sick at the moment, got a cold, don't feel particularly great. So, although that's very apt to what I'm doing, uh, I might cough, sneeze, splutter all the way through, so I apologise profusely. But hopefully, at the end of it, I'm going to feel better. Now, up to this point, hopefully you've recognised that food is very important during the First World War. For soldiers, it could mean that they would get fitter and healthier, uh, that it would help them fight, that it would help them relax, that it would help them celebrate, uh, or indeed just give them some element of comfort while they were serving. But I really want to look now at the food that was supposed to help men feel better, as in make them healthier if they were sick. And such recipes I could have considered were things like um, beef tea, chicken broth, um, jellied calves hooves, which I really considered, but after the whole tripe debacle, I thought, you know what, we'll go for something I maybe will enjoy eating uh, a little bit more than I did that. Um, so I've actually gone for onion porridge, which uh, is nowhere near as bad as it sounds, and rice water. So let's give it a go. Okay, so the onion porridge is a very simple recipe, and in fact this recipe comes from the 1915 British Manual of Military Cooking. And all you need is one large onion chopped into quarters, which I've actually already done because apparently when I chop onions I get emotional, and uh, so I thought I'd do it off camera, you know, save me some embarrassment, aside from this apron. Um, you've got salt, a little bit of salt and pepper, uh, you need a pat of butter, I'm not actually sure if a pat is an official regulation term, so I took it to mean like a, a knob of butter, a bit of butter, uh, some corn flour to thicken it up, and a pint of water. Simple as that. And all we're going to do is we're going to put it together into a saucepan and cook it up. And what's interesting is in the original recipe it says that this should be made once and then reheated and eaten before the men go to bed. Um, and then they're going to wake up from feeling much better as this is an excellent remedy for colds. So, definitely going to give that a shot. Now this recipe is particularly interesting because it comes under the tagline in the Manual of Military Cooking that when soldiers are required to attend to their sick and wounded comrades, the following simple recipes are useful. And this is fascinating because it shows that men are being encouraged to look after themselves or at least to look after each other. And this seems a little bit strange considering the fact that soldiers in the First World War had a plethora of medical services that are supposed to be looking after them. You've got the Royal Army Medical Corps, which is kind of the umbrella for all of these services. You've got the, the um, Ambulance Corps, which have the stretcher bearers. You've got a variety of medical um, facilities, such as casualty clearing stations, dressing stations, to get men sorted off the front line, usually for wounds. Um, we've got field hospitals. Um, just behind the front lines. You've got base hospitals and then hospitals all the way back in the UK. You've got ambulance trains and ambulance ships. There is doctors and orderlies and stretcher bearers and nurses and so many people who are supposed to be delivering medical care and yet right in the middle of all of this there is just this random assortment of recipes about well if you're not feeling too good well maybe you should try this. And this is where it gets kind of confusing because within a British soldier's diary the advice for soldiers is very clear it says when a soldier feels ill or when he requires medical treatment of any kind he will give in his name to a corporal in waiting and in that order he will see the surgeon he should be taken ill at any other time he will report himself to a sergeant in waiting he'll not treat himself or consult private doctors as men were very severely punished for concealing disease that is to say for not reporting themselves sick to the military surgeon. So, men should not treat themselves under any situation, right? However, within the guidelines, it then says this. Men must, however, make it a point of honour not to go sick unless they're really ill. So, confused, yeah, okay. Me too. Uh, well, maybe this is because um, there are different accounts of men deciding on the best treatments of their bodies throughout the testimonies of the First World War. Um, 
<clears throat> and at the moment, I have to be honest, as I put these all these ingredients together, which is essentially just the mixing of everything into a single pan and heating it up, um, I haven't found anyone who recounts eating onion porridge, which I was really disappointed about. I was really looking forward to someone telling me how amazing onion porridge was, but unfortunately, it's not the case. Um, however, <clears throat> I have found evidence of food being used for medical purposes. And as I put this on to heat, and what you want to do here um, is put this on to a medium heat and then boil it. And as it starts to break down, then you want to add your flour and stir it, okay? So we'll put that on to heat. Um, there. did find the account of Private Elder, who seems to have repurposed his food to try and make himself feel better. And he writes in his diary, about this time, we had an extra ration issued, a slice of bread along with scraps of dog biscuits for breakfast. Instead of eating the bread I was sorely tempted to do, I obtained a little ice and melted it over a fire and brought it to the boil and soaked the bread and formed a poultice to apply to the boils on my neck and hips. One may wonder why I didn't go to our doctor with these troubles. I could have easily done so, but at the same time, I fully realised the benefit I would get by doing so. And I also realised what would happen to me. The doctor would have immediately sent me away to hospital, which would have meant comfort, good food, bed and skilled attention. But on the other hand, I would have been sent to some strange battery when I was well again, and this was the last thing I wished for. I couldn't think for one moment of leaving the lads I'd been with all my days in the army. This, and only this, caused me to endure the suffering and discomfort. Now, Private Elder's concerns about his boils were pretty common. The uniform that men would wear would often be very rough, as we've talked repeatedly about the conditions, trench warfare, being wet and stuff, rubbing against the skin, being very abrasive. It's unsurprising that he, he had these issues. And yes, he could have seen a doctor if they were particularly that bad. And he may have been pulled off the line, but it seems that he chose to treat himself, which is indirect um, against the regulations, as we've already noted. And he's not the only one. You've got Private Fowler, and Private Fowler re actually worked for the Royal Army Medical Corps. But in 1915, um, he writes in his diary that he's also not following regulations. Um, he wrote, just a little bit more work to do. I'm feeling pretty bad. I have been for the last fortnight. No use reporting sick. I've ate nothing for a fortnight. Now, the stories are obviously very different, but they do have a commonality. First of all, they're both going against regulations. But second of all, food features in both accounts. You've got Private Elder who makes himself a poultice um, and actually sacrifices the fact that he's hungry. Um, and then you've got the other account where he doesn't eat at all. He says he doesn't eat for two whole weeks. And yet he's working in the middle of the He can see the importance of eating and still feels that he shouldn't report sick. Okay, so now we've got the onion porridge, I want to make the second dish. And the second dish that I'm making is rice water. Now, rice water has been a medicinal recipe for hundreds of years. Um, and the recipe that I'm actually making is an amalgamation of two recipes that I've found. Um, one of which came from the Manual of Military Cooking, uh, 1915, and the other one is from the 1911 Royal Army Medical Cookbook. And the reason I've amalgamated them is because I've seen this recipe so many different places, um, that some have sugar, some have raisins, some have both, and I wanted to try and make one that kind of encapsulated all of these ideals. So I'm using one that has the sugar, um, it has the raisins, and it has the rice. Now it says in the original recipe that you need to constantly wash the rice. You need about three ounces of rice needs to be constantly washed. Uh, so this has been washed several times. Um, you need about two ounces of sugar. Uh, you need about one ounce of raisins and somewhere between 500 mils to a liter of water. And it's very easy to make. We're just gonna mix it all together. Boil it for 30 minutes and then strain it and then drink the water, which, yum. Okay, let's give it a go. Now this is obviously a very simple recipe and it could be seen to be useful on the front lines, but also behind the lines and in hospitals. And that's really what I wanna go on to talk about because um, <clears throat> clearly on the front lines, things like a poultice um, and would have been very useful, but in hospitals and so forth, there's a lot of focus on building the men back up and rice water is particularly nutritious, it's got a lot of sugar in it. Um, so, 
we can see why it'd be useful. And in hospitals, um, men lived in an entirely different um, reality. Um, they would they'd lose their uniform. Um, they would now start wearing a pajama uniform, blue pajama uniform. Often, uh, they would go from being under the control of commanding officers to being under the tyrannical rule of matrons and sisters. Um, they would change their excursion destinations from enemy trenches and no man's land, and instead be going off, sometimes going off for tea in local villages. And the food changed, and the food is really important because apparently in hospital it could be a lot nicer. Now in 1917, Private Cobson was admitted to hospital and he wrote in his diary about the hospital and the conditions that he was in. And he wrote, I was taken on from St. Omer to a base hospital at Rimeur near Boulogne. What a relief. Some people hate hospitals, but I called it a haven of rest. I slept for nearly a day here and oh, the joys of a real bed. I wondered where I was. When I woke up, a nice nurse came and washed me and brought me some breakfast. For dinner, I had some jelly and custard as a flavour. I was in bed for a few days. So, Cobson presents a very different picture to what we've seen so far about men serving in the front lines, and in particular the food that they're eating. He's eating jelly and custard. And as we saw from Private Elder's account, Elder expected if he went to hospital to be getting better food, better grub, be better cared for and more and more comfortable. However, there is an opposite side to this because Private Floyd, who worked with the RAMC um, and there's also with the St. John's Ambulance, recalled in his diary that the food in 1914 wasn't actually up to scratch. Um, he complained that food improved a little. Yesterday, tin of salmon between three, a tin of sardines between us, a tin of headings between four. Didn't try the herrings, sardines not up to much, salmon's all right brought own bread in town, independent of biscuits for the time being. So this is quite interesting because, first of all, he's complaining about the food. Second of all, he's working in the hospital at the time. And third of all, he says about his biscuits. Now, we've already talked about hardtack. This was supposed to be an emergency ration. Try and work out why he's eating biscuits in the hospital. And, of course, it could be a supply issue. But this kind of shows a dichotomy between the mission statement of the Royal Army Medical Corps, because on the first page of the RAMC training handbook, it mentions food, and it says that it is the responsibility of the Royal Army Medical Corps to supply food, amongst other things, uh, logistics, travel, accommodation, that kind of thing. Um, but food is an important aspect, and not just for patients, but also for the staff themselves. But, as we can see, hospitals were offering decent food to patients, and in fact there's an entire section in the RAMC manual, it talks about things like roast fowl, lemonade, um, jelly and custard being offered to patients, but it seems that the staff, how to put up with stuff like this? It's not exactly fair, bless them. Okay, as for this, this is all done, it's all mixed together, put it on the hob, cook it for 30 minutes, and then you're going to drain it out, and you're going to serve the water. And I'll see you for the taste test for the delicious rice water and some lovely onion porridge. See you there? Okay, um, so the food's all been made and I've obviously made a, a wonderful transition from my kitchen um, to the University of Strathclyde. And I've done that for a very special reason because today I actually have a medical military historian here to be my victim um, to try the food. So I'm very um, delighted to introduce and thank Dr. Emma Newlands. Hi. Hello. Thank you very much for doing this. No problem. I know how excited you are to Can, eat. Cannot wait. Yeah, eat onion porridge. Um, so what I think we'll do is we'll just we'll dig straight in before it gets cold. Um, so to, so what you've got in front of you, first of all, is onion porridge, which is made up of a single Spanish onion separated into four quarters, boiled for half an hour with a bit of butter, a uh, quart of water, and some salt and pepper. Right. So, so we give it a try and see. It's very thing. aromatic. Yeah, <laughs> I think it smells lovely. Um, but I like onions. So, me too, but I don't know if I want a bowl of them. Okay. Actually, it tastes okay. Right. It's not. It doesn't have loads of taste. No, it, it essentially just tastes like very smushed onions with yeah. butter. Yeah. Um, in fact, if you put this on the side of a, of a plate with like 
Put it on a burger. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Also, a burger or like sausage and mash or something would be fine. Um, but apparently this was this was fantastic for colds. So if you had a cold, they would say, like, okay, make this recipe, and you you eat it before you go to bed. And the recipe itself, um, I found in the military manual, and but it also occurred in the 1917 version. It's in the Royal Army Medical Corps 1914 uh, handbook. But this particular recipe. I actually found back in the 18, in a book from the 1860s, a housekeeping and butler's guide, and it has the exact same wording, um, down to the letter, with the exception of at the end, it says um, that the recipe was told to him by a local friendly farmer. So it's quite interesting that, uh, um, that this recipe was just continued to be reused over and over and over in household guides and in soldiers' manuals. Yeah. So the second thing we've got for you, um, which I thought was a treat, um, and I actually didn't tell Emma um, that she was getting this, which was quite fun, um, is rice water. So the, the rice water uh, was boiled for 30 to 40 minutes with three ounces of rice, um, some sugar and an ounce of raisins, and then drained. And it's supposed to help with uh, kind of enteric disease, things like cholera or if you've got diarrhoea. So. Okay, looks like it would give you cholera. Mm -hmm. Oh my <laughs> It's so sweet. It's so sweet. Wow. I, I didn't expect that to be no. as sweet as that. Actually. Wow. Um, some of the other recipes for this didn't include sugar. And I put it in because the idea of eating, of drinking just rice and curries was, was disgusting. So I followed one of the recipes for Rob. Um, but I, you can see why you would drink it. Yeah, it's probably quite comforting yeah. in a trench. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I could drink a lot of it. Um, no. But if it's supposed to sell your stomach and it's supposed to provide kind of nutrients and so forth, then, then I can see why. I mean, so this is the kind of food that they would get in the first world war, along with like jellied cows, hooves, and things as well, it's supposed to make you feel better. Um, what about the second world war? Was it fairly similar in terms of food for health? Food for health um, in the second world war was very important. Um, there was a lot of emphasis put into how the men were fed, and I think that was largely because of the experience of the First World War, mm -hmm. um, and also developments in nutrition in the um, first half of the 20th century. Uh, in terms of what they would get, they would, I mean, they would enrich the chocolate with vitamins, for example. Really? Um, some men were given vitamin tablets. Um, uh, they, I'd never heard of rice water <laughs> in the Second World War. They did drink a lot of what they called beef broth, okay. which was essentially um, an oxo cube. Would they make it themselves? Yes, it would be in a ration pack. Ah, because there is beef broth in the First World War, but the recipe that I've got would be made from actual meat. They would use the meat and boil the meat up as stock and then serve it to them. Yeah. But they would actually get it sent as part of their well, emergency ration. Well, ration packs were much more designed to be made by the the owner of the rack, of the pack, oh, okay. so they were meant to be for men who were kind of away from uh, from the cooks and the, yeah, the kitchen. Yeah, uh -huh. Okay, yeah, good. Um, and what about things from home? Would people send them like tablets from the post and, and parcels with like stuff in it? And I, I'm sure cigarettes were probably the biggest um, <laughs> thing that men would say, and socks. But mm. uh, certainly um, chocolate, I think, yeah. sweets. Yeah. Um, Cool. Because yeah. uh, one of the things, I've, the reason I'm asking is, is I found in uh, a 1916 advert, which I'm going to pop up on the screen with the magic of television, um, which is from Horlicks, which encourages families to send soldiers a tablet, a Horlicks tablet, uh, which was supposed to give them vigour and strength for 24 hours. It's supposed to replace an entire like a meal or an entire day's worth of meals. Yeah. Um, so I just thought that was an interesting... Um, Horlicks is fairly... Robust, yeah. Stuff, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, if you remember the sweeps for Horlicks that were around, I remember them. Uh, they were great. Post in the comments. <laughs> the we're still trying to see if we can still get these. There is an alternative to what we've just eaten, and the alternative uh, is a little bit extreme. It is in fact a nutrient enema. Um, so during the first world war, Lovely. yeah, right. <laughs> during the first world war, they would offer you, uh, they would, they would give nutrient enemas to um, kind of helpless and invalid patients. And, and what this consisted of was obviously an enema, uh, which I'm not going to describe, but um, they would put a pint of peptidized milk um, through the enema every 24 hours, and a pint is a lot. Uh, and peptidized milk is high-rich powdered protein milk. Um, 
which I can't imagine would be very pleasant. Um, the idea was that you well, were... Well, if you were unconscious, you know, you're okay. That's a very good, good point, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not sure you would. Um, but the, uh, this actually, this practice continued all the way up to the 1960s. And how was the um, food absorbed? Well, I, I have to be honest, this is not my speciality, so I had to do some looking, but apparently it is perfect, it's possible to absorb the nutrients, which is one of the reasons why it was so protein-rich. Oh, right. Uh, was the fact that you weren't getting a lot, because yeah. a lot of it was kind of coming back out, yeah. um, but you were getting just enough sustenance to, to keep you going. So I suppose the question really is, what would you prefer? Onion porridge or a peptidized milk enema? Uh, onion porridge. Onion porridge for the win. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much uh, for being thank here. Thank you for feeding me oh. mashed onions. Yeah, you're very, very well. It's a delicacy. And uh, thank you guys very much for watching. Um, and I look forward to seeing you at the next episode. Thanks again. Oh, it's a lovely war, a lovely war to be a soldier, eh? Oh, it's a shame to take the pain. As soon as rebellion's gone, we feel just as heavy as lead. But we never get up to the sergeant and bring the breakfast up to bed.